Good afternoon. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd reporting from Florida and continuing NBC's breaking news coverage of the arraignment of Donald John Trump. The first time a former president has ever been arraigned on federal criminal charges, pleading not guilty to all 37 counts against him. The former president departed the courthouse a short time ago. He's now heading to the Miami airport. From there, he will fly back to his golf club in New Jersey. That's where he plans to address supporters tonight from his club, where he'll be spending the summer months. Moments before that, the former president made an unannounced stop, though it appeared to be somewhat planned out, as supporters were waiting for him at the well-known Cuban cafe for, uh, in Miami, particularly for uh, politicians, Versailles. It has been a must-visit spot for Republican candidates, whether you're running for dog catcher or president of the United States. He could be heard giving supporters an impromptu stump speech while calling the U.S. a nation in decline. It was quite the spectacle, somewhat unnerving for those of us who grew up in South Florida, seeing that's more been a symbol of sort of freedom and rule of law and things like that. To see it in a moment like this uh, was, was startling for some of us. Um, but let's back up for a moment. Here's how we got there. Mr. Trump left his club in Doral, Florida, not very far from downtown Miami. Earlier this afternoon, he arrived at the courthouse shortly before 2 p.m. Then he was booked, electronically fingerprinted, and appeared before a magistrate judge. That's where he uh, officially pleaded not guilty to 37 felony counts tied to his mishandling of classified documents. And according to one of our reporters who was inside the courtroom to witness the event, Donald Trump sat stone-faced. His body man, an alleged co-conspirator, Walt Nauda, was seated beside him. Nauda was not arraigned today because he did not have local legal representation. He'll likely be arraigned in South Florida later this month. NBC News has also learned that Special Counsel Jack Smith was in the courthouse during the proceedings. As the former president was preparing to leave for court, he again decried the indictment, calling it, quote, one of the saddest days in the history of our country. And the investigation, quote, election interference, because he decided to announce his candidacy as he knew these legal troubles were coming. And, of course, he used the phrase witch hunt. We then saw the chaotic scene as Trump's motorcade left the courthouse en route to the airport, a uh, handful of protesters appearing to run alongside. One tried to get in front of his motorcade, uh, which appeared to be the former president's vehicle. You saw Secret Service had to get out, tackle this person. Till that moment, though, protests outside the courthouse this afternoon had been largely uh, quite peaceful, with local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies having a very visible presence on the ground to discourage, uh, so they hoped, moments like what we saw as the motorcade left. And as we track the former president's movements, we want to remind you that this is not Donald Trump's first arraignment. And with two open investigations, one in Washington, the other in Fulton County, Georgia, may very well not be his last this calendar year. And yet the former president, twice impeached, twice indicted, who was also found liable for sexual abuse and defamation, remains the Republican Party frontrunner for the presidential nomination. Frankly, it's not that close. So, joining me now is our NBC News team that's on the ground in South Florida and in Washington. Our Justice and Intelligence correspondent, Ken Delanian. He's outside the courthouse in Miami. In a moment, we'll be joined by Guad Venegas, who was with the former president at Versailles in Little Havana in Miami. And Gabe Gutierrez was also in Miami. And Vaughn Hilliard is in Bedminster with the president. Let me, um, with the former president, excuse me. Let me start with Ken Delanian. Ken, you were able to, I believe, get inside the courthouse. Tell me your firsthand account. Obviously, there was a lot of this is perfunctory if this were any other uh, American citizen. Obviously, being a former president, nothing feels normal. What did you see? Perfunctory is a great word for it, Chuck, but there is nothing I've ever experienced like hearing a judge talk about a case called the United States of America versus Donald J. Trump. That is... There's nothing perfunctory about that. That was actually remarkable. Um, but other than that, you're right. I mean, this thing follows a script. This was a first appearance and an arraignment uh, before Mr. Trump got to the courtroom with his co-defendant, Walt Nauta. Um, they were both booked and processed by the federal marshals. And we're told that Mr. Trump's digital fingerprints were taken and that they did not take a mugshot. They used uh, another photo, one of the many millions of photos available of uh, Donald Trump as his booking photo. Uh, inside the courtroom, there was a table with lawyers from the special counsel's office, David Harbach, who, is, uh, who left the law firm to come join this investigation. Um, Jay Bratt, who's the chief of the counter espionage section of the Justice Department and is, uh, has been involved in this since the very beginning. He was one of the lawyers that went down in June to serve the subpoena at Mar-a-Lago last June. 
and then Julie Edelstein, a lawyer from the National Security Division. On the defense side of the table, uh, Mr. Trump and Walt Nauta were flanked by their lawyers. Uh, Trump, represented by Christopher Keyes, a Florida attorney, and Todd Blanche, his New York lawyer, who has who was admitted into this case in Florida by the judge, Aileen Cannon. Uh, Walt Nauta represented only by a Washington, D.C. counsel, Stanley Woodward. So he actually wasn't arraigned today. He didn't enter a plea. But essentially, they waived reading of the indictment. Uh, the judge asked how Mr. Trump pleaded, and, uh, and, and Todd Blanche said, we most certainly plead not guilty. Trump didn't say a word. He was stone-faced. He consulted with his lawyers. He was wearing a dark blue suit and a red tie. Um, you know, really not much else to say about it. They, after I left the courtroom, because I had to get out get out and sort of um, yeah. announce the news that Mr. Trump had pleaded not guilty, um, the judge did impose an interesting condition uh, that Mr. Trump not have contact with the witnesses in this case, many of whom actually work for him, including Mr. Nada. So that's it's going to be, uh, I'm sorry, not, not have contact, not discuss the case with these witnesses. Um, right. So that's sort of, I guess, on the honor system, how that works out. But... Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, one of many historic days we're going to see, Chuck. L let me ask you. I mean, one would are they going to form a joint defense, or is that not going to happen? D did Mr. Nada think it was going to happen? I mean, is that what why he ended up with no counsel? No, no. I think they are. This is a joint defense because remember, Stanley Woodward, his lawyer, has has been paid for by a Trump political action committee all along, and when the Justice Department okay. went to him and went to Nada and asked, would you, you know, we think you lied to us, will you cooperate? Uh, he told them to go pound sand. No, they, 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 you know, they're basically, NADA has maintained a united front with Trump despite an opportunity to flip on Trump. That's the bottom line. And so, look, that could always change, right? But at this moment, NADA right. is represented by a lawyer that's being paid for with Trump political funds. So it is a, it is a united front. Now, we know that Judge Aileen Cannon is likely to be the actual federal judge to oversee this case. When is the first time, when is the, I guess maybe the, when, when would we have a hearing in front of her for the first time? So they didn't, they didn't set a schedule today, so we're not, it's not entirely clear, but it should be soon, within a week or two or a couple of weeks. Typically, a federal case can take about a year to get to trial. This isn't a very complex case, but there are some issues that need to be hashed out, particularly around the classified information. Um, but it could take a lot longer than that if some significant issues are litigated and have to go up to the appeals court. So um, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a case that could be, it could take six months, it could take a year. It could also still be pending um, by, by the time the 2024 presidential uh, election rolls around, which is a, a kind of an outcome that is almost hard to imagine. Yeah. Ken, did you see, hear anything from the defense team that gave you a hint at what the various delay tactics are going to look like? We know that's a strategy. And by the way, as you and I are talking, we are showing pictures of the motorcade is now on, this is not the way most people get to board a plane, on the uh, tarmac uh, of Miami International Airport as they head to the actual plane itself. And he will walk onto his Trump-branded plane there. But did you get a sense of what the delay tactics will look like? Not at this hearing, no. I mean, legal experts have said that one of the obvious avenues for them to attack is the ruling, the secret ruling by a judge in Washington, D.C. that allowed the prosecution to pierce uh, attorney-client privilege by invoking the so-called crime fraud exception. And by doing that, they got one of the most powerful pieces of evidence in this case, which is a series of notes that were uh, originated as iPhone memos by Evan Corcoran, one of Trump's key lawyers in this case. And that was incredibly, incredibly damaging and quoted verbatim in the indictment uh, that, you know, used to support the charges of obstruction of justice and of lying and of trying to hide classified documents. So they will attack that. We don't know, though. We haven't seen that judge's uh, opinion about why she she invoked the crime fraud exception, what her reasoning was. But that's certainly one thing that is likely to be litigated, Chuck. Uh, Ken Delaney, uh, with, uh, who was in the courtroom as this was pr proceedings were happening. Ken, thank you. Uh, I think I have Gabe Gutierrez with me. Uh, Gabe, do I have you with me? I know you also yes. uh, were able to get, in, get inside that courtroom. Gabe, what more would you add to what you saw in your familiarity with this? I know you've, you've sort of uh, seen this a few different ways. Uh, yes, Chuck. Well, Ken laid it out very nicely. A couple of points that I will add. Uh, special counsel and the reporters that were inside uh, the courthouse um, noticed that Jack Smith, special counsel, was in that courtroom, just feet 
from former President Trump. Now, my colleague Garrett Ake was also in uh, the courtroom a few rows away. He did not see uh, the former president look back at Jack Smith. But the significance of that, the weight of that moment, special counsel just feet away from the former president as his proceedings got underway, was incredible to witness. Now, Ken mentioned the significance of this. Hearing a judge, a magistrate judge, talk about uh, the United States versus Donald J. Trump. And I, I was struck by that moment as well. I wrote down the case number, 2380101. What would be considered just another case number, but this is the arraignment on federal charges of a former president of the United States. And speaking, you know, big picture in terms of this location, Chuck, I know you're going to another reporter at uh, Cafe Versailles, but to see this all unfold in South Florida, yes. you're from Miami, you know this area well, just to see this swarm of media, the swarm of attention descending upon South Florida felt very different than it did up in lower Manhattan where we were uh, several months ago witnessing uh, the arraignment there. Of course, the stop at Cafe, Cafe uh, Versailles just before uh, he headed to Miami International Airport. We're looking at those live pictures right now of uh, the Trump motorcade uh, heading up to the airport. But this was a very different scene down here than it was in New York uh, several months ago. Yeah. One, of course, the location is much more spread out, didn't feel as claustrophobic in a way uh, for the media and the public. Public, uh, assembled here. But just remember, 24 hours ago, Chuck, we were all talking about these security preparations and everything that was expected here. The local authorities were preparing for as many as thousands of people that could descend here yep. on the federal courthouse. And that just did not materialize. And all we, we did see, you know, one uh, demonstrator go in front of that motorcade, and there was some activity as the former president left this area. By and large, it was very a uh, peaceful uh, afternoon, and that's certainly what law enforcement, uh, you know, wanted wanted to see. Now, as for what happened in this uh, courthouse, again, Ken uh, laid it out quite well. Should be interesting to see how this legal case plays out. And we were in. We were also hearing that Walt Nada, because he did not have that local counsel to sponsor him, now he is expected back in court in just several weeks for that formal arraignment. But again, uh, kind of a strange, uh, unusual arrangement there with the former president yes. of the United States and Walt Nada, his body man. Uh, we just saw him in the video over at Cafe, Cafe Versailles not being allowed to speak um, with this uh, about this case. Uh, but again, so many questions here now about the timeline, the discovery process, and whether this case as well as the hush money case down in lower Manhattan, how this plays out in the coming months and year as the presidential campaign really ramps up, Chuck. He is starting to accumulate quite a bit of legal fees as well. But uh, Gabe, I'm glad you brought up uh, the moment at Versailles because in many ways, I'm going to move over to Guad Venegas, who is uh, on the scene for us there. Um, and... Donald Trump, Guad, seemed to be able to take advantage of the fact that he had political allies in the area, whether it's in Miami-Dade County, in the uh, exile, with, uh, the exile community of Cuban Americans and Venezuelan Americans, or you know, a lot of his own supporters, who actually, and, and even advisors who live not very far from him uh, in South Florida. So he had the ability to create the perception of of political strength today. Jack Smith doesn't hold a political rally. He can. Uh, I've, I've seen Versailles. That was a, it was not an unfamiliar setting, but it was just sort of remarkable to me, Guad, to see it be used to, to go against America's rule of law. This has been a symbol of, of, of freedom and democracy in many ways. So it was, it was a bit, it was a bit surreal for me to see it used in this way. Chuck, uh, this is, uh, Café Versailles is here near Little Havana. It's, it's the center of Donald Trump's support within the Hispanic community here in Miami. In fact, people here are still partying. This was sort of a pro-Trump rally. You can see dozens of people still behind me celebrating. At some point, Chuck, they sang happy birthday, saying tomorrow's Donald Trump's birthday. Yeah. Let's sing it so that the cameras can capture that. And, and Chuck, after he entered uh, the bakery side and 
uh, spoke to supporters, walked outside, and he shook hands with a lot of the people that were here, which, which by the way, Chuck, a lot of these individuals had no idea Donald Trump was going to stop by. These are Trump supporters that come to Cafe Versailles. They've been here before to support Donald Trump for different reasons. In fact, this is one of the areas where Latino Republicans will protest in favor or against anything that's making them happy. This is uh, the famous H Street or, or Calle Ocho right. uh, here in Miami. You know, Chuck, I, I think there's two places in Miami where you find strong Latino support for the Republican Party and Donald Trump. One is, of course, Doral, with, where uh, the Trump Golf uh, Resort is, where he stayed. And the other one is here in Little Havana, the favorite size. So, of course, this was uh, one of the places where he would arrive and have all the support. Right. The people here were thrilled uh, to have him come by. Now, Chuck, that was a non-scheduled stop. So when, when we saw the Secret Service arrive, uh, you know, the security detail that we ourselves were working with uh, at NBC explained to us what was happening. And it was quite interesting, Chuck, uh, to hear him explain that an unscheduled stop like this one could be a nightmare for the Secret Service. They had to sweep as many people as they could. And it was difficult because people were so happy and excited when they found out that Donald Trump was coming that they started rushing this area. So it was, it was a, a bit of chaos here right before he arrived. And as you saw in the images, when he arrived, uh, the people were happy. And another surreal thing, Chuck, uh, they were playing salsa music. It was, it was a Latino party with salsa music right. and Donald Trump uh, right here with his supporters. You don't see a scene like this anywhere else in the U.S. That's, that's what's very unique about the Hispanic community yep. here in South Florida. And, and you can hear people speaking behind me. And the conversations here are, of course, in support of Donald Trump. We've heard on and on again people yelling Donald Trump for president again. So uh, this is the scene, what it's like. There's a vehicle driving right next to me with flags, Trump team 2024. We've seen that all day, Chuck. Vehicles that drive by honk and support the protesters. So uh, perhaps quite different from what yeah. you would see in any other, any other Hispanic communities uh, in the U.S., Chuck. No, it is it is uh, quite the scene. I mean, here he, he spent the night in Little Caracas, which is what Doral has basically become unofficially, and he, and he stops in Little Havana right before he takes off. These were not accidents. He's politically couldn't be better situated, at least for his image conscious self uh, in both of these moments here. Guad Venegas with some terrific uh, on the ground reporting for us. Guad, thank you. Let me move over to Sam Brock because Sam, largely your reporting all day had been, it's pretty peaceful, we're in pretty good shape, looks like authorities did a good job of showing themselves and then the motorcade moved and we saw the vulnerability in real time. You saw secret service agents jump out. You don't see that very often. Uh, what seemed like a really tight security situation suddenly was not very tight. And you kept sort of showcasing this. You said, you know, people can get really close here. They can get really close. Well, lo and behold, they did. Let me just say, Chuck, it's a very good thing that there were not any serious injuries that we're aware of or physical confrontations. But we saw signs, little hints that, you know, maybe security had some vulnerabilities throughout the day, namely the fact that there was a gentleman who was carrying a sign. And I'm not talking about the person that rushed at the motorcade, who was walking alongside the federal courthouse before Trump even arrived for the arraignment, carrying a sign that said, this ain't Fifth Avenue. And he was immediately accosted by DHS officials and removed. But he was walking right along the building after this had all been taped off. And namely, that's really the heart of the problem here, at least from the federal government standpoint. We know that the U.S. Secret Service does have, and U.S. Marshals has jurisdictional authority over the actual courthouse itself, but they are cooperating and working with Miami police. And Miami police made the decision to have all these folks out here where you could actually walk onto the street, and you'll see behind me, there's this tape. There is a police barricade, and this was even fortified earlier today. And there's a street across the way where the motorcade came in and out that was cordoned off. But if you wanted to just walk down here, hundreds of people, Chuck, without any sort of detection, no metal detectors, there were police officers on the ground, but everyone was just kind of clumped together in this space, hundreds of people just standing right here within proximity to the building. And the irony to all of this is the U.S. Secret Service, which has commented on the general dynamic and said they were concerned about lack of a hardened perimeter, uh, did say that they weren't necessarily concerned about the former president. They were concerned about the people out in this plaza because it would just be so easy in a state like Florida where gun laws are so loose to carry a weapon. And they said if there was any level of combustion, things could go haywire in a second. What ended up happening is everything was pretty calm out here, but somehow someone was able to rush at the motorcade. How he got back there 
no idea. Certainly, none of the folks out here were able to gain access to the other side of the building, but he did and rushed at the Trump motorcade with a sign and, as you said, was tackled by Secret Service. So it's going to be very interesting to see what Miami City Police Department has to say about the planning, the good part, that there was nothing that really blew up out here, but also the bad part, which is someone got that close to a former presidential motorcade. There's no doubt that there is going to be probably an assessment of how to protect this courthouse when the trial itself and the next events there happen. Sam Brock uh, covering all of the protests for Sam. Thank you. Well, let's uh, let's get a preview of what we can expect tonight in New Jersey at his golf club from Bedminster. As you can see right now, uh, Donald Trump and his plane is on the tarmac here getting ready to take off and head to New Jersey. We're already there. That's where we find Vaughn Hilliard. So, Vaughn, we have an idea of who's going to be in the audience tonight. In fact, one of the who's is a senator who ended up inadvertently helping Demo uh, the Biden administration uh, get, uh, get a nominee cleared because he decided to hurry up and get to Bedminster and skipped votes. And that's Tommy Tupperville, Republican of Alabama. But what have you learned? Who's going to be there tonight? What do we expect? Anything new? to the former president's rhetoric. Right, Donald Trump, I don't think, has made it a secret to anybody. He's been quite explicit in stating that loyalty is key to his own political endeavors, but also the way that he suggests it to the millions of Americans who have voted for him and are considering voting for, to, for him, is that it's the way to be successful for the conservative movement, the MAGA movement. Not only is Tommy Tuberville going to be here, but also a name, Bernie Moreno. He is from Ohio. He is a U.S. Senate candidate. Trump has suggested uh, uh, positive things about him in the past, leading to potential endorsement of him. But there's also Jeff Gunter, who is considering a Senate run in Nevada. He will be here tonight. And that is because when you look at the politics of this, you know, Donald Trump still holds significant weight among the Republican electorate. And you see that in the polling that came out from CBS yesterday, in which 76 percent of likely Republican voters believe that this is political uh, persecution, uh, political targeting of Donald Trump. And, you know, if you go back to last year, Chuck, it, it, well, Donald Trump, several of his endorsed candidates lost in the general election. He effectively purged the loudest critics within his party. Party, the likes of Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and Tom Rice. And so when you look at the crowd here, Donald Trump is going to give these primetime remarks uh, in front of potentially, you know, a, a couple hundred folks here, but also millions of Americans are going to hear him on outlets like Fox, on OAN, on Newsmax. And the reality that Donald Trump has painted for those millions of Americans is a far different one than what is laid out by the Department of Justice and special counsel in that indictment released here this weekend. Well, it'll be interesting tonight. I, I wonder if the rhetoric will seem repetitive rather than new, uh, but we shall see Vaughn Hilliard uh, with a preview of what to expect. Vaughn, thank you. Joining me now is a couple of our legal experts to sort of break down what we didn't see today ourselves, but what, what they know happened in that courtroom. We've got Cynthia Oxney, a former federal prosecutor and an NBC News legal analyst. And also with me is Bradley Moss. Uh, an attorney who specializes in national security issues, which, of course, this classified document situation is. Cynthia, let me just simply start with you. I think the, the biggest, I guess, small surprise is what we saw with uh, the co-conspirator on the fact that somehow he's going to stay the valet, but they've been ordered not to communicate. He doesn't yet have legal representation in South Florida. I, this seems unusual to me. How unusual is this? Well, I think it's pretty unusual, but he'll get the representation. There'll be a joint defense agreement, and they'll be able to talk with their lawyers present. It's a weird situation because of the employment agreement. And quite frankly, how is it going to be enforced? I mean, neither one of them is going to—I mean, Trump's not going to tell the truth <laughs> right. about who he talks to about that. So we'll just see how that plays out. The interesting thing is down the road, if he ever flips, is there a danger to Trump if he has, in fact, violated the court's orders? But— I, I, I'm not sure he's going to flip. People seem to be very loyal to Trump, even though he's never loyal to them. But we'll just have to wait and see how this plays out. What would you be doing as a prosecutor right now to flip him? Well, I think they're doing a pretty, I mean, they're doing a pretty good job. I mean, putting in the indictment the specific lies that he he's dead to rights in that indictment. 
And once he gets right. a lawyer that's a South Florida lawyer, and once he has, you know, he has his other good lawyer, you just have to have conversations with him. I mean, he's headed to jail. And there's a guy who um, has a lot at stake and not a lot of options like Trump does. I mean, it's one thing, you know, if Trump's convicted, you could make an argument that, oh, well, they're, they're never going to be able to actually restrict his liberty because he's the former president and somebody will right. pardon him. If there's a, you know, so, I mean, you can make a bunch of arguments how Trump can, something different will happen to Trump. This now to guy is a run of the mill, has lied to the FBI and they've got him dead to right. So he's going to jail. And, and you just have to have that conversation with him and with his lawyers that there's a one way road on the loyalty train with Trump, which I'm sure yeah. everybody's quite aware of. Bradley Moss, let me bring you in here. If you're representing Mr. Nauta, uh, it's it a no-brainer to plea and get out of prison? I mean, it seems as if he is not going to be able to avoid a conviction here. I don't know. Yeah. Cynthia, let me go to you. I, I think we don't have uh, Mr. Moss's audio. He doesn't have mine. Let me just throw the question to you. I mean... What attorney wouldn't be recommending that to Mr. Nauta? Uh, none. I mean, I, I think that that is the <laughs> smart play to protect your client. And that's obviously, even, no matter who's paying um, the lawyer for Mr. Nauta, their obligation is not to who's paying. Their moral, ethical, and legal obligation is to Mr. Nauta and to give him good advice. And I find it hard to believe that there's any advice that doesn't include taking a plea and trying to figure out how to stay out of jail. Um, walk me through what the next three to six months are going to look like in this trial. You assume if the former president wants to do everything he can to delay, how to walk me through the start of the delay process, I guess, is the way to put it. OK, well, the first thing that's going to happen, I mean, in addition to the arraignment of Mr. Nauta, is that the judge will issue a scheduling order and we'll know something about if she's going to be a participant in the delay based on what the scheduling order looks like. And then there's a whole process of turning over the documents, of the lawyers getting uh, security clearances, of the court figuring out how they're going to deal with the top secret documents. There's a whole you know, aspect of the, the, the back and forth on how those documents are are going to be introduced. Will there be the actual documents? Will there be substitute for the documents? Will we have agreement on what should be said? That's a whole that's a whole way to postpone and to argue back and forth, and that can be a source of delay. Uh, so far, what I hear from the defense uh, on our air is basically prosecutorial misconduct. That's not going to work. That's not going to be able to delay anything. Mm -hmm. There will be motions um, in an attempt to uh, restrict the government's ability to use any of the information from Everett and Corcoran. The, back, the briefing and the back and forth on that can take some time. So it really, the judge in this case has an ability to drag this out so that it could be right. after the election. And we'll have to wait and see. Let me bring in, I think we have Bradley Moss now, here. Yeah. Right. Let me bring in Bradley Moss. I think we have you here. We were talking about the essentially how to how to delay this if you're in the Trump side of things. I'm curious what you thought of Jack Smith's personal presence at the arraignment today. I think that was deliberate. I think that was to make clear to Mr. Trump, look, I'm here. I'm the one leading this. I'm the presence who's overseeing it all. And you don't intimidate me. Jack Smith took town war criminals. He's not intimidated by Donald Trump. But to follow sort of what my colleague was mentioning there a moment ago, a lot of what we expect Back to here, a lot of the delay we expect to see is going to be in the pretrial motions. It's going to be efforts not just on the prosecutorial misconduct allegation, but much fun. Everett Corcoran, his notes, the testimony before the grand jury, that was so critical to the right. indictment against Mr. Trump. The details were so critical. They have to try to get that in fights. He's pretty much done at trial. There's very little substantive defense at trial against those details. Well, how do the other uh, uh, legal uh, issues play into this? There's going to be a Manhattan trial. There already is that. Those motions are going. We have Fulton County, and we might have January 6th. In fact, just today, a grand jury in Washington, D.C. heard uh, testimony from some of the 
uh, alleged fake electors from Nevada today, which, of course, is another aspect of the Jack Smith investigation. Very quickly, Bradley Moss, uh, how, how will that impact the timing of this trial? It's going to cause some chaos with all these different cases, especially given that he's going to be on the campaign trail. How is the different you know, pretrial discovery going to take place? How are these trials going to take place with someone who's on the campaign trail while having to be present for these different cases? How many of these different cases can they do at one all time right. leading up to this election? We don't know. It's going to be fascinating to watch and quite the spectacle and, frankly, quite the education, I think, for a lot of uh, lawyers these days for all of us. Cynthia, Bradley, thank you. And thank you all for being with us for this truncated version of Meet the Press Now. It's been a busy day. I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now and NBC News Now coverage continues with this continuing breaking news story. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.